So we're in, yeah, we're in Galatians chapter two. And last time we were on, let's see, look about around verse 11. This is where Paul had to confront Peter, the, the pillar. I mean, Peter was like the, you know, the main, main apostle, I guess you'd say he, he was always listed first. He was like the, he's probably the oldest. He was, he was the, the spokesman really. And, uh, you know, some, the, the Catholic church considers him the, to be the first Pope. So he was, he was pretty prominent and, but yet Paul had to confront him. Paul had to, to his face and in front of the, in front of all the people there, he, and, uh, he had to do it publicly and, and I'm sure that had to take a lot of courage for Paul to do that. And it was only, you know, only because God had laid that on his heart and the Holy Spirit enabled him to do that. Um, and, you know, he did it the right way. He did it to, to, to his Peter's face, you know, just like Jesus tells us in Matthew 18, if your brother, if you have odd against your brother, go to him in person. And that's what Paul did. Cause you know, the easy thing would be for Paul to talk about him behind his back. Right. I mean, isn't that what, unfortunately you know what we tend to do you know it's or or we'll you know we'll maybe we'll mention it to our prayer group and say you know pr you know pray for you know pray for jim he's really gone off the rails when you know but what you know i mean it's good to to pray don't get me wrong but you know we, we should be when if someone is is an heir we should we should confront them and, and speak the truth in love um now when paul spoke to peter it may, maybe it didn't sound like it was in love i mean he was pretty he was pretty blunt he was pretty harsh with him and he did it he did it publicly um and that's actually in line with scripture as well paul in his letter to timothy when he's uh first timothy i believe it's chapter 5 verse 10 or 12 something like that where he's given the you know, the requirements for to be a leader an elder um he says he says first of all he says don't don't uh, believe any accusation unless there's two or three witnesses it says but if, if but if he's an heir and he, he's s sinning publicly he says uh confront him publicly uh, let me let me read that because i don't i don't trust my memory i think it's first timothy chapter five um, let's see Hmm. oh here it is yeah verse uh verse 19 i was i was wrong it's verse 19 um it says don't receive an accusation against an elder that would be peter one of the leaders except on the basis of two or three witnesses so he had he had done this in in public peter had, he had been uh, hypocritical there there were multiple witnesses so paul you know he 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 didn't just take it on the word of one person so he says first must be two or three witnesses and then verse 20 those who continue in sin rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest also may be fearful of sinning so he he did it in public um I, I I would have been probably afraid to do it in public if it was me. I, to be honest, I might have done it in in private, but he did it in public, and uh, and to Peter's credit, he was humble enough that he accepted that that rebuke from from Paul. And if you recall what he was doing, Peter was he had he had had that vision from God back in Acts chapter ten about the Gentiles that he was not to call any man or woman unclean which is what the, the Jews considered the Gentiles to be unclean. And so they, the, the Jews would not associate with Gentiles. In fact, they would consider themselves defi defiled if they came in contact with a Gentile. So, but God get, made it clear to Peter, you know, don't call anyone unclean. What, you know, Christ has cleansed every person who, who has put uh, trust in him. So Peter because of that revelation, Peter did begin to associate with the Gentiles. We saw him go to Cornelius in, I believe it was Acts chapter 10. Cornelius was a Gentile. He even went into his house, which would have, that was a major no-no for, a, for a, a Jew to go into a, the house of a Gentile. So Peter did, he, God got the message across to him that 
you know, it's okay. You're, you are to associate Gentiles, associate with Gentiles. But then Peter slipped back into fear of man whenever he would eat with the Gentiles. But yet when the, the Jews, the, the, the Judaizers would come by and they'd see Peter eating with the Gentiles, he would jump up. He would, he, he didn't want to be associated with them because he was more concerned with what the, his fellow Jews would think about him. And so Paul called him out for that hypocrisy. He says, you know, you're compelling the, the Gentiles to live like the Jews. You're, you're saying, you know, well, okay, but if you, you know, if you Gentiles, if you become circumcised and you follow the dietary laws, then I'll go ahead and associate with you. And so that's, he was, the, the big concern there was that he was distorting the gospel. He's doing the same thing that the Judaizers were doing, saying that, yeah, okay, you Gentiles can be part of the, you know, part of the group, part of the church, as long as you are circumcised and keep the law of Moses. They, remember, they had that big meeting in Jerusalem, the council in, in Acts 15. They had a big uh, big discussion with all the leaders. They said, no, we we believe that the Gentiles are saved by faith in Christ, just like the Jews are. So anyway, that's the background that catches you up if you missed last week. So uh, as Paul confronted Peter and then we're, although he called him Cephas uh, whenever he was, and I think Carly, I'm like, you were the one that, if you made that comment about, you know, how your mother, whenever you're in trouble, your mother calls you by your full name, not, you know, not your, you know, it's not, uh, you know, for me, it would be, you know, James or whatever. Or, anyway, that, that's possibly what was going on there. He's, he's calling him out because you, you know, Peter, you're in the wrong. So I'm calling you Cephas, but anyway, um, anybody ever, what, what did your mother call you, Joanna, when you, <laughs> when you were, in um, usually it was like, Joanna Grace, because that's my middle name. Mm -hmm. That's when you knew you you were in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, all right. So we're down to, let's see, verse 16 is where it's an interesting statement Paul makes there in verse 16. I think it, like three times in one sentence, he, make, he keeps reiterating, we're justified by faith and not by works of the law. I think he said it like three times there in one sentence. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we may be ju justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Okay, I think I, we get the point now, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So that brings us up to our first question for tonight. It's in verse 17. Well, no, I'm sorry. Um, it's verse 18. Uh, the, the, well, I might as well cover verse 17 too. He says, if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found to be sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. And uh, several times in Paul's writing, like in, in Romans 6, he had to say something similar. Whenever, whenever you're sharing the, the gospel of grace, that that's, seems to be a, a common uh, response and it, it usually means that, that whoever you're sharing it with, that they're starting to get the picture of what you're talking about. For instance, um, in, in Romans 6, when Paul was talking about righteousness that comes, receiving the gift of righteousness that comes by faith, that we're not justified by the law, right away he has to say, now, does that, well, he had said, where, where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. And he has to follow that and saying, now, am I saying you know, because we're saved by grace that we should go on sinning. He say, said, you know, God forbid, may it never be. And that's, I, I, get, I guess, well, someone once, I heard someone once say to me, you know, if no one, if you're never accused of being light on sin, you're probably not presenting the gospel clearly because that that's the message that comes across when at least that, that came across to me. I think back to whenever I was saved, before I was saved and, my dad was sharing the gospel with me. I remember him saying, you know, you're, you're not saved by keeping the commandments. You're saved by faith in Christ. And I remember thinking, well, you know, if that's true, you know, what's going to keep people from just going out and living like the devil? Because, you know, hey, apparently it doesn't matter if you keep the commandments or not. It's only if you trust in Jesus. So you know, Paul had to 
several times he had to correct that thinking you know, the what what's going to keep you from living like the devil is being born again receiving the holy spirit becoming a new creation so we need to you know share the whole present the whole gospel that you know it's it's more than just believing in, in jesus it's putting your full way of trust in him and becoming a new creation so that you now have a new nature that doesn't want to sin so anyway that was that was a bonus that uh but anyway does that, that make sense but yeah i have, I have um, a thought on that and yeah, when, um, whenever i'm talking with somebody and they'll say oh yeah i believe in god but you, you know and i always remind them well the devil believes in god too yeah. so belief isn't just enough it's more than belief right right yeah good point heather yeah, it's, it's more than just believing the, the facts about Jesus, right? It's it's putting your full way to trust in him to the point where you're surrendering yourself and, and you become a new creation. So, yeah, good point, Heather. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, now down to verse 18. That's, that's our uh, first question for tonight is, uh, should be question 22. What did somebody want to read verse 18? Paul is going to talk about rebuilding what I destroyed. So what? go ahead and read verse 18. I can read that. All right. Thanks, Cheryl. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I proved myself to be a transgressor. Okay. So what, what's Paul talking about there? He, he, he just got done saying in verse 16 that we're not, we're not justified by keeping the law. We're justified by faith. And in verse 17, he's talking about if seeking to be justified in Christ, we, we are found to be sinners. So then verse 18 ties, it follows right along with that. If I rebuild what I have destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. So okay. what, what do you think he's talking about there? What do you think he's talking about rebuilding? I think he's talking about rebuilding his reputation when he um, uh, really uh, persecuted the saints. And if he went backward and did that all over again, he would be a transgressor of his own belief because now he believes in Christ. But maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I thought. You're you're on the right track. You're on the right track. I think. Uh, anybody else have any any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Oh, here. No. Um, let's, how about if we go to Philippians three, that might give us some insight. Um, Philippians three. Remember Paul, Paul was a Pharisee, wasn't he? He, he was a, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was, he was zealous for the law. And as Connie point out he was he was persecuting the, the christians he was so zealous for the law that he he thought he was doing god a favor by destroying these christians that that were saying you're not saved by the law philippians chapter three yes. <clears throat> philippians chapter three um let's see yeah. we start at Let's, we'll start at verse four there. Philippians chapter three, verse four. Paul's saying, he said, I might have, if anyone has, well, he talks about being the true circumcision, the worship in the spirit of God, glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Verse four says, I myself might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone would have confidence, have a mind to put confidence in their flesh, I would even more so. And then he, here he gives his resume. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church, which mm -hmm. Connie mentioned. As to the righteousness, which is in the law, I was found blameless. But whatever these things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I now count them but rubbish that I might be might gain Christ. 
Does that give you a little insight on what he might be talking about? Mm -hmm. How how is Paul trying to attain righteousness? How is he trying to attain a, a right standing with before God prior to knowing Christ? Prior to knowing Christ, it was through his acts and his his resume and his heritage. Yeah, yeah. It was is all all his good works, his adherence to the law of Moses. All, he was he was trying. It was self righteousness, wasn't it? He was he was uh, trying to attain righteousness through him through his own works, through his through his heritage, through his lineage, through his adherence to the law. So he, he says now he considers that garbage. That's garbage now. He's he's thrown it away. He says now if I rebuild that, if I go back to trying to become righteous through the law, he says that's what he destroyed is his his righteousness, his his self righteousness through the law. If I go back and try to rebuild that, try to make myself righteous through the law, he says all I'm going to do is prove myself to be a transgressor. I'm proving that I'm a sinner. Which isn't that what the law does? The law shows us that we're sinners, doesn't it? Paul, Paul's going to write that himself. He says the the law points out that uh, points out our sin. Uh, that was that was the purpose of the law. And he's going to say in, when he gets to Galatians chapter three, he's going to say that the law was our tutor. It was our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. The law the law points out that we can't uh, make ourselves perfectly righteous. It, it, it shows our need for Christ. So, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So if I rebuild it, I'm going to prove myself to be a transgressor. It's going to show that I that I'm a sinner, and also what the law does, it it points out our sin, but it actually it stirs up our sinful desires, doesn't it? Paul's going to write that in Romans seven. Um, he says that he says uh, he said I wouldn't even known what sin was if the law hadn't said. I uh, wouldn't have known what covenant was if the law hadn't said, thou shalt not covet. He said, but the law stirred up the, my sinful passions. And, you know, we see that, we, we see that in our, in our own lives. Um, for instance, uh, well, one of the examples I like to use, if you, if you're, say you're in a, in a park, there's a park bench there and it says, do not touch wet paint. Yeah. You know, what, what do you want to do? do you, aren't you tempted to go up and touch it? See if it's really wet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if but if that sign wasn't on there, you probably wouldn't even think about it. You just walk right on past. So you know the the law says thou shalt not covet. So if I'm living by that law, thinking, okay, now I I better not covet, yeah. or I'm yeah you know, I'm gonna not I'm gonna be in trouble. You know I'm gonna start coveting. Like it's like saying you know don't think of a pink elephant. Okay, if you. Yeah, all right. I'm not going to think about a pink elephant. What comes to mind? Pink elephant, right. Yeah. So right. that that's what's so ironic about the law. You, you know, mm. we we think, oh, I've keep the Ten Commandments. That's going to keep me from sinning. No, it's not. It's actually going to uh, make you more prone to sin. It's it's God's grace that teaches us not to sin. T Titus mm -hmm. chapter two. Paul says it's the grace of God that teaches me to say no to ungodliness and to live an upright and righteous life. So it's, 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 uh, and I don't know, probably be, until you're saved, that probably doesn't make any sense. But now that, that you've all experienced salvation, you probably, you can probably relate to that, that now you don't want to sin. And it's not because, you know, God's sitting there with his, you know, yardstick, getting ready to to whack you when you do it's because of his love and his grace you don't want to sin anymore now because he's been so kind to you he's forgiven you and he's well plus he's put his holy spirit in you we we don't want to sin now but it's, but it's not the law that keeps us from sinning it's his grace does that, that make sense yes yes yeah all right good okay so Question 23. This is going to be verse 19. Somebody want to read verse 19? Galatians 2, verse 19. Okay. All right. Thank you. For through the law, I died to the law 
so that I might live to God. Okay. So so what does he mean about what does he mean to die to the law? He says, through the law, I died to the law. I think it means to die to the law. Obviously, it doesn't mean literally died because he's yeah. still he's still alive. Anybody have a thought on that? He didn't have any desire for the law, and it didn't and didn't affect his life, and he didn't even think about it. He had a whole new renewed mind. Okay. All right. That's that's a that's probably a good way to describe it. Yeah, he became you could you could say he became uh I guess you could say he became dead to the law or became separated from the law, you know, because because death really is separation, isn't it? Yeah, you know, when we die, when we die physically, we don't cease to exist, but we become separated from our body, don't we? The our body and our soul become separated. Same thing when when we're when we're dead spiritually. Mm -hmm. our spirit is separated from god's spirit but when we become alive spiritually our spirit is joined with with god's spirit so when paul says i died to the law he's saying basically what connie said that i be, i'm separated from the law it no longer i no longer have a relationship with the law i'm no longer using the law to try to make myself righteous before god um for, for good to romans romans 7 it might shed a little light on that. Romans sure. 7, verse 4. Sure. Romans 7, verse 4. Um, well, actually, let's start at verse 3. Uh, no, let's start to... Might as well start at verse 1. We'll, we'll go to Romans 7, verse 1 through 4. It says, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, I'm speaking to those who know the law, the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives, okay? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. Mm -hmm. So when, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Now here, verse four is what I wanted to get to. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. Okay, that sounds similar to what Paul says there in Galatians 2.19, through the law, I died to the law that I might live to God. Okay, so in Romans 7, he's saying you were made to die to the law, so that relationship you had with the law is over. You're now separated from the law. Now that you can be joined to another, you can be joined to the one that was raised from the dead. You can be joined to Christ. So I used to be married to the law. I died to the law. Now I can be married to Christ. I'm joined to him now. Does that, that make sense? Yeah. All right. So I'm died, dead to the law. Now I'm joined to Christ. And the reason what the result then in Romans 7, 4 is now that I can bear fruit for God. Before, when I was married to the law, when I was joined to the law, I, I couldn't bear any fruit for God. All, anything I did was for self, wasn't it? It was, if I did any kind of good works, it was so that I could either get a pat on the back or so that I could think I was in good standing with God. Now I can bear fruit for God. Any, any good works I do now, I want to bring glory to my Father in heaven. I don't want to I don't need the pat on the back anymore. I don't, it's it's not going to make mm -hmm. me any more righteous in God's sight. So anything I do now, any good works, I can bring, give all the glory to God for it. I can bear fruit to God. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like you almost, yeah. Yeah. doing the law, you're, you're, um, you're self-centered, but when you're doing God's will, you're God-centered. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah the good side yeah yeah good good point thank you cheryl yeah mm -hmm. yeah your folk you can take your focus off yourself now can't you i don't mm -hmm. have to try to try to earn god's acceptance i can my focus can be on christ bringing glory to him my focus can mm -hmm. be on others loving others leading them to christ 
Now, now bear fruit to God. Hebrews 9 says it pretty much the same thing, but let's go ahead and read Hebrews 9.14. It says it's slightly different, but makes the same point. Hebrews 9.14 and Hebrews 9 is talking about the Old Covenant, which is essentially the law, living under the law. He's talking about the Old Covenant, the sacrifices that you had to make under the Old, under the old Covenant. <clears throat> talking about how you had to sacrifice bulls and goats and so forth in order to, to for this temporary cleansing, cleansing of your flesh. Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more now will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So Christ's blood cleanses us from these dead works, these dead works of, of self-righteousness, these works that I tried to do to try to make myself righteous in God's sight. Christ's blood cleansed my conscience now, conscience now from those dead works. So it's now I can serve the living God. I can serve the living God. I can bear fruit for God. That's another Another way of saying what Paul said in Romans 7 and Galatians 2. Hmm. All right. All right, back to Galatians 2. Okay, so he died to the law. Now he can live to Christ, live to God. Plus, yeah, it says it's three different says it three different ways. Galatians 2 says now he lives to God. Romans 7 says he could bear fruit to God. And what did, what did Hebrews 9 say? I forgot already. To serve, okay? Serve the living God. So serve the living God, live to God, bear fruit to God. That's the result of dying to the law. All right. Ready to go on to the next question? Mm -hmm. okay this is verse 20 everybody probably has this one memorized that's i i've i don't know how many times i've quoted that one somebody want to read verse 20 galatians 2 20 i think that's a great great verse galatians 2 20 i can read it all right thank you I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. All right. Amen. I, yeah, I love that verse. So what, what do you think it means to be crucified with Christ? Hmm. Well, I don't mean to be talking so much, but I think um, being crucified with Christ is like if we, when we become Christians, we become like Christ. Um, and the world hated Christ, so the, you're going to be hated too in different crucifixion type ways. Like somebody, they don't know why they li don't like you, but they don't like you and they do mean things to you. Because really, they see Christ in you. So that's the mm -hmm. devil that becomes seeing Christ in you. So that's one of the ways you're going to be crucified. Or kicked to the curb for no reason. But there is a reason. Because the enemy works through the people. Okay. All right. I think those are all true truth statements you made there. We, we become identified with Christ. And so we're going to suffer with him, aren't we? Jesus said mm -hmm. that the world hates hated me that it's going to hate you as well so yeah I'd, I'd agree with all that yeah but but jim i have a question um i always thought that or or sense that some people before they go home from the lord they, to the lord they're going to go through a big trial sort of like when christ did before he hung on the cross he went through these big he, he went through the trial and the cross was a big trial so I kind of think that that as Christians, some kind of way we're gonna go through that. Is that do you feel that way? Or do you or is it true? Or could you explain? Well, I 
I th I think we're all going to be our faith is going to be tested at some point in our lives, don't you think? We there's there's going to be uh, Peter says says there's going to be trials. Said the troubles you go through don't said don't be surprised when you go through these fire, fiery trials. Said your brothers all over the world are going through trials. So yeah, I I would agree that we're all going to go through trials, persecution. Paul said, everybody who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So yeah. I, I think I, I think it's a guarantee. G Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. He didn't say you might. He said you will have trouble. So I, I think we're all going to go through tr uh, trials, persecution, tribulations. I, I don't know if it's if that's exactly what you're looking for, Connie. I, you know, I, I don't know that we're going to be necessarily crucified physically like christ was P peter was peter was crucified upside down but but I, it's a guarantee that we're going to have, have difficulties and trials and our faith is going to be tested yeah i was more i understand that part but i was um more or less thinking about before you die is it going to be a trouble or a trial you go through you know so I don't know. I I just sort of thought that um, looking at the way things happen from people I knew that passed, they they went through a big trial before they passed. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know where. Yeah. You're you're saying everybody's going to go through a big trial right be, right before they pass. Is that what you're saying? Another. Yeah. I, I think some sometime or some kind of another. It's mm -hmm. it's like visualing when Christ was crucified before he had to carry his cross before he got crucified. I I might not totally be knowing what I'm talking about, but that's just what I observe from people that I know that passed. They went through this big trial, like they got real sick. Or um, okay. they were hurt, or something happened. Okay. All right. That's interesting. I never thought of that before. Yeah. Yeah, I can't say I have either. Do you think the trial would be what we're going through now, and as the world gets worse, you know, because the devil messes with us more when things are going well, you know, or when we're you know, up on the top of the mountain or whatever. But, you know, the I think the trials will get worse, but we have to suffer. That, that's how we learn and grow close to him, yeah. you know. And I, to me, that could be considered a trial. You yeah. Know, so bother, it bothers you. And like Connie said, you know, they hated Christ, they're going to hate us, you yeah. know. Yeah. Oh, that's a big trial. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll say, Yeah. Yeah, but, and Peter also said that that when we do go through the trials, it it pr proves that our faith is genuine as well. So that's yeah, yeah that's that's encouraging. Yeah, when if we're going through trials, it it yeah. should if if our faith is genuine, it's going to cause us to draw closer to the Lord, isn't it? Definitely. The, the worse things get, the more we're going to draw close to the Lord. So and it, it just proves that our faith is in Him is genuine. Yeah. Well, that explains a lot. Hmm. <laughs> a lot of hardship. Yeah. So, so you're close to the Lord. You're saying, Heather, you're you're going through. Yeah, it? I'm very close to the Lord. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Usually, when we're going through the hardships, we don't don't like them. But after we're through them, we it's, we usually find they were and end, end up being a blessing, don't don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yep. it's, it's down in the valleys that we have our our greatest spiritual growth. It seems. Yeah. Yep. Mountaintops are nice, but the valleys is where the growth occurs. All right. So yeah, crucified with Christ. Um, yeah, I think everything that's been said. Yeah, you know, we're definitely gonna experience some trials, some of the suffering that Christ did. Um. In this context, perhaps um, it, it might go back to verse 19 about dying to the law. Maybe we're crucified as far as our old man, our old nature is crucified and is dead. 
Um, Ro mm -hmm. Romans 6 alludes to that a little bit when he talks about baptism. Uh, Romans 6, it says, let's see. Well, yeah, we'll start at verse 1. Romans 6, verse 1, because that's that, that, that verse that I quoted earlier where he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? That, that goes back to what I had said when I was doing the summary about how you know we're often accused of giving people a license to sin when we're sharing God's grace. So anyway, so how shall we, we who died to sin still live in it? Okay. Verse three, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? So when we're, when we're baptized into Christ, uh, um, it's water baptism in particular, it's a, it's a, it's a picture. It's an illustration of being identified with Christ in, in his death and his, his burial and his resurrection. And Paul's going to explain that here in these next couple of verses. So, so our, our baptism is, Baptism means to be identified with. Um, whenever, back in the in the Greek language, they would when they would dye a piece of cloth, it it was it was baptized into a vat of dye. That was the word used because you have say you have this white cloth, you you baptize it, you you immerse it into this vat of red dye. It becomes totally identified with that red dye now. Now you pull it out, and now it's it's completely red. Same same thing when we're baptized into Christ, we become totally identified with Christ. We become identified with Him in His death, in His burial, and His resurrection. And Paul's going to explain that here in in Romans six. He said we've been baptized into Christ Jesus. We've been baptized into His death. Therefore, we have been buried with Him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. So we too might walk in newness of life. We have been united with him in the likeness of his death. Certainly we shall also be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. He who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Um... Let's see, I'm going to, is that a good place to stop? Knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead, never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. Death that he died, he died to sin. Once for all, with the life he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Okay, so there he's tying it back into the, the law again. When, so we, we've died, we've died to the law. We've died we've been crucified with christ we're identified with christ our old man our old nature is dead now our attempts to make ourselves righteous through the law that's dead we're buried with christ we've been raised now to walk in newness of life we've become a new creation in christ our old man is dead we're now a new creation those who are in christ jesus are uh, a new creation the old is gone the new has come does that does that make it a little clear Mm -hmm. yeah all right yeah okay so yeah crucified with christ now we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for the one who loved us and gave himself up for us and back to galatians chapter two i could add more add more questions to that verse so crucified with christ it's no longer i who live but it's Christ who lives in me. So, you know, when we when we were born again, when we were buried with Christ, when we came up out of the water, now, now I should I shouldn't say it that way. The that was a picture. The coming up out of the water is a picture of our being born again. 
the water didn't cause us to be born again, but that's a picture of us being born again. Okay, so we're born again. We've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, haven't we? Christ is now, the Holy Spirit lives in us. Christ now lives in us. So he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me through the Holy Spirit. So the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself, gave himself up for me. So we no longer live by the works of the law. We live now by faith in Christ and he's now living. He's expressing his life through us. And that's, that's the fruit of the spirit. When he, he's going to get to Galatians chapter five, the fruit of the spirit, that, that fruit of the spirit is the character of Christ, isn't it? You know, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc. That's Those aren't characteristics that you and I can muster up in our flesh. That's something that, that Christ has to produce through us. We, we bear his fruit. That's why it says bearing fruit, because I can't produce that fruit. I can only bear it. Christ is the one that's going to, is the one who produces it. Mm -hmm. So Christ is now living in me. He's producing the fruit. He's producing the character, the, that new nature. Does that, yeah. does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a supernatural life that we're living now, isn't it? Yeah, we, we can't. We, we couldn't produce, you know, the righteousness God requires, even, even in our flesh, even with Christ living through us now, we're still not going to live perfectly righteous because we still do have that flesh that, that occasionally, hopefully it's occasionally and not constant, not habitually, but you know, hopefully we're walking in the spirit more than, more so than in the flesh. Mm -hmm. When we do. When Isn't we're... it the Holy Spirit that does this for us? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. 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 It's, it's the Holy Spirit that does it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The Holy Spirit uh, produces Christ like character through us. And that'll, we'll get into that more when we get to chapter five. Yeah. All right. Anybody have any more insight on that? Any, anything else to share on that? Hmm. Uh -huh. All right. Um, all right. The, the next question, question 25, what's wrong with trying to be justified by the law? So somebody want to read verse that goes with verse 21. Doesn't that seem like a good thing to do? Try to try to keep the commandments and justify myself by the law. What does Paul say? What happens if I try to do that? If I'm trying to make myself righteous through the law. So we want to read verse 21. Galatians 2, 21. Um, I'll read that. All right. Thank you. 21. Okay. I love God, God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do not nullify the grace of God for his righteousness were through the law. Then Christ died for no purpose. Okay. All right. So if I, so what would it mean if I, if I could make myself righteous through keeping the law, keeping the commandments, the one way good works, what it, says, it looks like two different things happen there. What, what would it do? First part of that verse, what happens? It just says there's no grace. It would nullify it. It, it would say. nullify God, yeah. and there is grace God. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part of that. What you said? Yeah, there is grace of God. No, yeah. it's just there's not. If you just stick to the law. Right. Yeah, it would nullify it. There's mm -hmm. it's either going to be grace or law. You can't combine the two. And that, well, that's basically what the Galatians were trying to do. They were trying to combine law and grace. They were saying, okay, yeah, you're you're saved by by believing in Jesus through his grace, but then you've got to go back and you've got to keep the law in order to, I don't know, perfect yourself is what I think he's going to say that in chapter three. We're going to say, so now you're going to try to perfect yourself through the flesh, through the law. So yeah, you can't, can't mix the two. J Jesus in, in the, the gospels, Jesus likened it to putting new wine in old wine skins. Yeah, you can't, if you try to mix law and grace, you're going to destroy both but if you put you know how the the wine skins were in the old days it was it was a a uh a, an animal skin and and what you did you put new wine in these new wine skins this 
this wine skin, it was soft and flexible. This, this uh, animal skin, you put the new wine in, the wine ferments, it expands, and the, the wine skin stretches to hold the, the greater volume of, of wine. Mm. But it's only good for one time. You, you try to, it's only going to stretch so much. You put new wine, you take that old wine skin. Now you have to, now, you, now that wine skin is fine for storing that old wine because it's only going to expand, it's only going to ferment and expand so much. Now you take that old wine, you dump it out and you put new wine in that old wine skin again. That new wine is going to ferment, it's going to expand. And that, that wine skin, that old wine skin is going to burst because it can't expand anymore. So what Jesus was saying there, when you try to put new wine in old wine skin, he says you're going to destroy both. What's going to happen? The wine skin is going to burst. You're going to destroy the wine skin, and you're going to destroy the the wine as well. So if you try to mix law and grace, you're really destroying both because you're taking away the the fear, the the punishment of the law, and you're destroying, you're nullifying God's grace. So you can't mix the two together. It's either law or grace and the law law is good it's holy and righteous and it has a purpose the purpose of the law is to show me that i'm a sinner to lead me to christ and then i'm once i the law does its job i die to the law and now i'm living for christ i'm living by grace god's grace saves me and god's grace sustains me so i don't i don't mix the i don't want to mix the two together because i'm going to destroy both is that, is that making any sense Yes. Yes. Thank you. Good. And it does one other thing too. If I try to make myself righteous through the law, what what's the last thing in verse twenty one? Oh, I should I should give you time to think about the first one. I I'm sorry. I, I know that's, that was a lot to ponder. So I'm sorry. I shouldn't have rushed to the next point. Everybody have time to ponder that or before I rush you on to the next point? <laughs> it means that Christ didn't have to die for us, you know? Yeah. And, and he did. He went through a lot, you know, just for us. Amen. Yeah, what, what an insult that, that must be to God. If I'm trying to make myself righteous through the law, because I'm saying that Christ died for nothing, right? If I can make myself righteous through the law... Jesus didn't have to die. It it was a waste, a waste of his of his time, not just his time, waste of all his suffering, his humility, humbling himself, humbling himself, coming down, taking on human flesh, walking among us, all the suffering he did was for nothing. Yeah, are we talking about um, the law in Leviticus or the Ten Commandments? Um, both really. <laughs> It's primarily the Ten Commandments, but it what the law in Leviticus would that would be encompassed with that as well. It's basically any kind of you, you could really make anything a law as far as trying to make yourself righteous before God. I could make it a law that I have to uh <laughs> pray three hours a day. If I don't pray three hours a day, then I'm not in God's good, I'm not on God's good side, but, but, but it's basically the, the 10 commandments, the law of Moses. Um, again, you could include the Levitical law as well. It's, it's trying, it's tr basically, it just means I'm trying to earn my way to God. I'm trying to earn his acceptance. I'm trying to make myself righteous by the things I do or don't do. So well, what do we do with the 10 commandments now? What do we do with them? As I mean, how does that now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, as believers, we certainly don't go out and deliberately break the Ten Commandments. We're we're now Paul Paul's gonna tell us in Galatians 5, he says, he says, what matters is um uh, he says, don't use your freedom as an opportunity of the flesh, but use it to serve one another in love. And if I'm serving others in love, I'm not gonna steal from them, am I? That's not love. I'm not going to covet their house or their car. I'm not going to commit adultery with someone else's spouse. That's not love. So if I'm if I'm loving others, I'm not going to be breaking the commandments, am I? So it's but I but I, but I don't but I'm not going to 
live by the Ten Commandments as far as thinking that that's going to put me in a right relationship with God. That's going to be more of a byproduct of, of trusting in Christ and expressing my faith in him through love. Does that answer your question, Connie? Yes, yeah, so it's sort of like a guideline, but we don't really uh, uh, worship it or or adhere to it as much as, as the like the law doing Moses and stuff like that. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm I'm saying you don't even need the guideline because God says in the New Covenant, He says He writes His laws in our hearts and on our minds. So He's in we we're gonna know the the right thing to do and we're going to have a desire to do it because he's given us his spirit to live in us so i don't need to live by the by laws written on stone i can live by the law the law of love that he's put in my heart mm -hmm. oh so you're saying that even though the ten commandments says thou shalt not if we believe in the lord and he's in our heart that we're going to obey those inadvertently anyway yeah, that's a good way to say it. I, yeah, it's going to be a yeah, it's going to be a byproduct. I, yeah, but yeah, inadvertently, however you want to put it, we're gonna we're gonna obey it without intentionally obeying it. I guess I, it's it. Um, I don't know, but that's a good way to. I don't know how to describe it any better than that. We we don't. It's not like we get up every morning and we keep this checklist. Okay, I I'm going to do this and do that this today. You know, basically, if I'm if I'm keeping my focus on Christ, trusting him, the Holy Spirit is going to lead me to, to love others. And he's not going to, the Holy Spirit is not going to lead me to sin. He's not going to lead me to steal. He's not going to lead me to covet. But I don't have to try to follow a list of rules. I All I needed to follow is Christ. Trust him and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. But I understand that. I okay. understand that. Okay. So what is what is the reason that that we all observe the Ten Commandments then? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good question. How here's what we use the Ten Commandments for now. Let's go to Timothy. Timothy. First Timothy. First Timothy chapter one. We we use the law now when we can use it when we're witnessing for Christ. Here's, here's what 1 Timothy chapter 1 says. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Let me know when everybody's there. Okay. Timothy. That, that's, that's a great question, Connie. Yeah. Hey, guys, I have to, I have to jump off. Okay. I'll catch I'll catch up with you next. Is it next week or the following? Um it's gonna be let's see, yeah. Let me check the calendar real quick. I'm sorry, what did you say? It's gonna be not be it's not gonna be until the seventeenth. It normally would have been next week. We moved it up to this week because I'm going to the Bethesda banquet. So yeah, it'll be the seventeenth. Okay, sounds good. I'll look out for like an email or something. Yeah, yeah, I'll send you an email. But, yeah, it's going to be like three weeks from now. Okay, sounds good. All okay. right, well, thanks for letting me listen in, but oh, I have to get going right now. Great having you. All right, we'll see you. Okay, Take care, Heather. Okay, is everybody on First Timothy chapter 1? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, First Timothy chapter 1, looking at verse 8, says, We know the law is good. Paul told us that in, in Romans 7, he says the law is good, it's holy and righteous. I mean, that, that shows, that's God's uh, holiness, his righteousness. It says we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, okay? We have to use it lawfully. Realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous man or woman, okay? That, that's you and I, we're righteous because of the righteousness of Christ that's been imputed to us. It's been credited to our account. We're not righteous because of anything, um, anything we've done or not done. We're righteous because Christ's righteousness has been credited to our account. Okay, so the law is not made for a righteous man or woman, but it's made for those who are lawless and rebellious. That's all the unbelievers, the ungodly, the sinners, the unholy, and the profane. 
for those who kill their fathers or mothers for murderers, immoral men, homosexuals, and kidnappers, and liars, and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Okay, so that's basically all those things that are listed, and that, and, that, and I'm sure that's not everything that could have been listed. Basically, what Paul is saying is the, the law is not made for believers; it's made for unbelievers. So a person that hasn't come to faith in Christ yet is still under the law, aren't they? They're, the the law still says uh, the wages of sin is death. The soul that sins, it shall die. But the law still applies to everybody who has not come to faith in Christ. When we get to Galatians chapter 3, he's going to say the, the law is our schoolmaster to, to lead us to Christ. So now that we've now that we've come to Christ, now that faith has come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. So a believer is not under the law, but an unbeliever is. And I yeah, and I well, I was gonna say that you know an unbeliever needs the the fear of punishment in order to keep in line, although the law just all it does is stir up the our sinful passions. Um, Romans 13 says that God uses the human government to keep the lawbreakers in line. So they have not just the moral law, but you have the, what would you call those, like the law of the land to, to keep the unbelievers in line. So I don't know. Does that, does that help at all, Connie? I mean, we can still use the law when we're witnessing. If, if someone claims if you ever if you ever watch like a YouTube video of uh, like Ray Comfort, he uses the law when he's sharing the gospel with someone. Well, he'll use it before he shares the gospel. He'll he'll go up and he'll interview people. You know, say you know, are you a good person? And of course, ninety nine percent of people say, oh, of course I'm a good person. And he'll say, okay, well let's let's see, let's take a little test. He says, have you ever used God's name in vain? And they'll say, oh, well, of course, you know, I've used God's name in vain. He says, well, then you've broken you know, this commandment. You, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God in vain. They'll say, have you ever stolen anything? And they'll say, well, of course, you know, I've taken a pen or a piece of candy. And he says, well, he says, what does that make you? The, the, law, the law of God says, thou shalt not steal. So what does that make you? And he says, well, that makes me a thief. You know, he says, have you ever lied? The law says, thou shalt not bear false witness. And everybody will say, well, of course I've lied. And so who use the law in that way, he'll say, okay, you've just admitted that you're a lying, thieving, blasphemer. Uh, you know, go down the list. I mean, that's that's what each one of us was when we were lost, weren't we? And yeah. and he'll say, okay, so what if you were to face God today, do you think you'd go to heaven or hell? And and if a person's honest, you'd have to say, Well, you know, I I deserve hell. So then that once a person is convinced that they're a sinner, then you then they're prepared for the good news. Then they're prepared for the gospel. And that's what Paul was saying, going to tell us in Galatians chapter, in chapter three of Galatians, he's going to say the law is our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. So once the law shows me that I'm a I'm a wretched sinner and I'm deserving of hell, I'm going to start looking for a savior. I need help. You know, God save me. I'm and that's where Jesus comes in as as the Savior. So that Help at all, Connie? Yeah, that, that helps. I, mm -hmm. I understand because okay. it was sounding at first contradictory and it kind mm -hmm. of confused, but I understand. I understand okay. now. Yeah. Yeah. Now, just because we're not under the law doesn't mean that we go out and deliberately break the law. That doesn't mean we're free to go out and, and murder and, and rob and lie and things like that. It's just that, that as a believer now, we don't need that written code to, to enforce our behavior. We've got the, the Spirit of God living in us. We've got Christ living in us. We've got the Holy Spirit living in us. We've got God's law written on our hearts and our minds to, to tell us not to do those things. Thank you. Sure thing. Thanks for asking that question, Connie. That was a great question. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that was our next to last question. So how does all this impact us? What, what How do we respond to to what Paul shared here. This is this all good news about what, what Jesus has done for us? Pretty yeah. good. News? Yeah. Kind of yeah. Good, huh? yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so how should that this impact us? What 
what can what do we learn that can help us this week? Anything, any takeaways from tonight? I think it gives me hope, you know, like no matter what's happening um, and just it's going to be okay. Yeah. You know, God's by my side all the time. And I just got to remember that and um, trust. But it's, it's it's hope for the next day. Like, Amen. okay, it's going to happen tomorrow. Okay. Well, it's okay. He's got it. <laughs> I just need to give it to him and let yeah. him have it. Yeah. So, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything that stuck out for you today? About the Ten Commandments, what I just talked about, that okay. stuck out to me. Okay, yeah. good. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyone else? Yeah, like Connie said the uh ten commandments that stuck out to me as well okay mm -hmm. good yeah good i'm glad you asked that question connie mm -hmm. yeah because i know that was something um that that was that always uh i don't know i always had questions about you know what what about the ten commandments you know do we just ignore them now you know because it didn't make sense you know we don't we don't want to go out and just yeah, live like the devil. So, yeah. All right. Anything else? All right. Would anybody like to pray for us? See, Dan, Dan's not here. He's our designated prayer. I say, is Dan here? He's not here. Would you like to make the other guy? I designate Ryan because the mentors are leaders. What do you think, Ryan? All right. I got one second. All right. I'll give it a shot. All right. Can be simple. Mm. Yeah, yeah, we ain't we ain't perfect. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, dear Heavenly Father, I ask thee as a as a part from our uh, our Bible study tonight that you got us into good temptations and continue to follow your ten commandments. And follow the law and have respect for one another and be there for each other. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, amen. Ryan. Appreciate you praying. You're welcome. Probably got you out of your comfort zone a little, but that Yeah, you did. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> we're we're family. We're brothers yeah. and sisters. Oh, yeah, we are. Yeah, appreciate you. Appreciate you praying for us, Ryan. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Appreciate your insights. And, uh, gee, it's going to be three weeks. That's a long time. So, yeah. all right. Well, you have a blessed rest of the week. And uh, you know, keep trusting in Jesus. We've been crucified with him, and he's living in us now. All right. All right. Blessings to y'all. Thank you so much. Uh, Welcome. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.